housekeeping, uh, housekeeping details to go over. If you look at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you'll see the live transcript, the CC button. It has been enabled. If you would rather not see it, you can click on it and click hide. Uh, when we get towards the end of Joe's presentation, you can go ahead and type in your question in the chat function. And for those of you following us on Facebook Live, you can type your questions into the comment section. Lindley, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Laura. I believe we can start recording this now. Um, I want to say nyawa skano gogoigo. Lindley B. Logan here is your host for our Native American artists in the Salish Sea and their public art installation Zoom series works. Greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Welcome to our Zoom audience and welcome to our Facebook Live audience. Our staff team here at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center are pleased to have you join us each day this week for a wonderful lunchtime discussion with Native artists in the Salish Sea area and their artwork practice and the recent public art installation work. This is our third day of our five-day lunchtime Zoom series. And each day our guests will present their artworks in a different medium for their public art installation work. Andrea Wilbur Seigo will be our guest tomorrow and Teresa White will be our guest on Friday. Our intent in hosting these Native American artists in the Salish Sea and their public art installations is to showcase some of the recent successes of indigenous artists in being awarded public calls for art and to encourage other indigenous artists to pursue and apply for public calls for art. As Laura said, we'll take questions after Joe's presentation. Um, and as she explained, if you have a question and you want to ask Joe, please type your question in the Zoom chat box and Laura will read your question to, for Joe's response. Um, we are also carrying this presentation on Facebook Live, so you can type your question into the response on Facebook Live and Amber will read your question for Joe. As I said, today we have Joe Seymour joining us. Uh, Joe's bio is posted to the Evergreen Longhouse Facebook page for your reading pleasure. And Joe, I believe, has been a, a friend of Longhouse for closing in on close to 20 years. So once again, thank you all for joining us. And let's get this Zoom party started. Welcome, Wahalutsu Joe Seymour. And thank you for being such a wonderful friend of the Longhouse and joining us for this public art Zoom series. Joe, the Zoom room is yours, brother. Thank you, Lindley. Um, Toa Gulapu. Gulapu Tadishad, Gulapu Tadishad, Wahalatsu Titsta, Wahalatsu Titsta, Wahalatsu Titsta, Squawksadabs Chas, Pueblo of Akama Chas, Talal Ste Chas. Um, to all you folks, you are my family, you are my friends. Wahalatsu is my name. I come from Squawkson Island, and I come from the Pueblo of Akama in New Mexico. Um, I currently live in Olympia, which historically has been uh, called uh, Stechas, which is a p place of the black bear. Um, and uh, like Lindley said, I've been a, um, a, a part of the, the Longhouse community for almost 20 years. Um, my first exposure to the Longhouse was um, an artist or a carvers, wood carvers gathering um, and I really, really wasn't much of a, a carver back then. You know, I was just, you know, someone who, who carved a paddle at that point. So, um, you know, to, uh, to be among people like, uh, Joe David and Dempsey Bob, um, you know, my, my mentor, Andrew Wilbur Saigo, um, you know, to just witness all of them, you know, working was really, really just amazing to me. Um, and I had no idea. Uh, that I'd be able to uh, kind of um, walk the same path as as some of those artists. So, um, you know, it's just, you never know what the future is going to hold. Um, I just kept showing up to events at the Longhouse. Um, in 2006, the Longhouse um, received a series of Ford Foundation grants where they hosted um, some residencies with, with, uh, with artists like um, Susan Point. Um, I, I believe Larry McNeil came in to do a, uh, a digital um, session. Uh, Preston Singletary came in to do, you know, glass blowing, 
And I got to be a part of that um, uh, residency. And, you know, during those those four days of working with, with Preston and work with uh, the Longhouse staff and working with Andrea um, and her husband, Steve Saigo, you know, I realized that, you know, I, I wanted I want to be an artist. So I I called my boss up in Seattle. I was a, working as a you know marine construction, underwater construction. I called my boss up in, in Seattle and I told him that I quit. You know, I'm, I'm going to become an artist now. And and poof. <laughs> Just like that, I was an artist. Um, you know, I started buying a lot more supplies after that, and I, I, you know, because of the Longhouse through the, you know, through their work, I was able to be a part of, um, you know, Pico, the Indigenous Artist Gathering in uh, Hilo, Hawaii, and you know that was my introduction <laughs> into the international artist community. So I was really, really just kind of amazed that you know all the things I got to do early in my career um, and and so you know just through constant working and and, and constant showing up to um, you know galleries and museums and making myself known showing constantly showing them my work um, you know I, I got to be known you know as a Coast Salish artist so um, you know and then eventually along the way um, you know I, I, I got I got to do some some public work um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to start sharing the screen and I have a PowerPoint rigged up for everybody so we'll talk about just uh, some of my public works that I've done so yeah this is our native artist talk lunch series and like I said Wahaletsu is my ancestral name Wahalatsu comes from my great grandfather William Bagley on my father's side, um, and uh, when I when that name was placed on me, I went to my language teacher and asked her what it meant, and she didn't know. So we went to her language teacher um, Zomai, um, you know Zeke, and he didn't know what that meant. So we went to his language teacher, who was Vi Hilbert. And she didn't know, so you know she advised us to say that, you know that's that's an, my ancestral name, and the meaning has been lost. So really, there's no understanding as to what Wahalatsu um, means. I just know that it belonged to my great grandfather William Bagley, um, and really that's everything I really create. Um, you know that's related to Salish work. I sign with my ancestral name. So, but you can make checks out to Joe Seymour. So really, this um, when I moved to Olympia, this was my first exposure to Salish public art. Um, you know, the Sea to Sky Valence above the parking garage, um, you know, done by Susan Point. And if you're not familiar where that is here in Olympia, I think it's on, um, I want to say 11th, as you're driving toward, as you're driving east. Um, you know, there's a, a parking garage for the Department of Natural Resources building. And that valence is right there, and at night it lights up. It's really amazing, um, and it, it's just a stunning piece. I, I still love love driving by. It's not really a busy road, but I love driving down there and then looking at that piece. So really, that's my exposure to um, you know Coast Salish public art. And you know, like I said, um, Andrew Wilbersigo um, is my cousin, and she helped she helped me help me carve my first paddle for the journey to Tulalip in two thousand three. And, um, you know, when she put this welcome figure up over at um, South Puget Sound Community College here in Olympia, you know, I was able to witness that. And, um, you know, she's been really uh, just a huge part of my career. Um, a lot of what I know about Coast Salish art um, comes directly from Andrea and, and actually her family, too. Her dad, um, Ruth, her husband, um, you know, they've all really been supportive of, of my career. They've really been encouraging um, of everything that I've done and you know they've been so you know just share their knowledge of carving and art um, techniques so they, they everything they know about art they really they shared with me and I've really been you know grateful for that so but you know watching that welcome figure go up was was really just a you know a big day for everybody and um, you know it's a, a big step for our community <clears throat> So my introduction to uh, 
you know, public installation was for the, when we, when Squaxin Island hosted Canoe Journeys in 2012, um, you know, the call went out for a, a mural to commemorate Squaxin Island hosting Tribal Journeys. And, um, and I know, I know a couple artists, you know, they submitted designs, um, and the, uh, the Olympia Downtown Association, you know, sponsored this, this mural. And, you know, they really wanted someone who was from the Squaxin community to be a part of this mural. And, and so I came up with a design that, um, you know, I, I titled Squaxin Sailor Sun. Um, and it had seven canoes on the water. There was a big giant sun in the middle. And, you know, the seven canoes represented the seven inlets of Squaxin Island. And, um, you know, um, at the same time, there, there was a, he, um, he doesn't live in town anymore, but he still has a presence in the community. At the same time, a, a muralist and sign painter named Ira Coyne submitted his design, which was really similar. You know, he had a big giant sun up in the, in the sky and canoes on the water. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and and the, the downtown association right away, um, you know, saw both of our designs and they said, well, can you work with this, this artist? And um, I saw his work that he did with the Rebecca Howard mural um, on, on the bread peddler um, who that, that store is on, on Capitol Boulevard. Uh, just south of um, state or just north of state toward the water and so if you go downtown you look at that Rebecca Howard mural and it's it's still up it's an amazing mural and our Ira is just a super talented muralist so you know I said hell yeah I want to work with him so you know we we got together after after the um, you know the downtown association suggested a collaboration and it took us all of five minutes to incorporate our ideas into the mural um, and, um, you know, when it came time to, uh, to paint the mural, we, um, you know, the downtown, uh, Les, the old Les Schwab building, um, you know, was the, the site for that, for that particular mural, um, because of its location right next to the water. Um, and, um, you know, Ira brought in his mentor, Vince Ryland, and one of his friends, Kevin Booten, to, uh, be a part of this mural. So there was four of us working 19 days, um, to uh, have the mural done by the main landing at um, the old uh, Cascade Pole site by Swantown Marina. So, so when we take a look at here, you know, with that, unfortunately that Les Schwab building isn't here anymore. Um, you know, it was bought out by a developer who put up the Lorana development, which sits there now. But, you know, you look at that top, that top picture, you know, that was the blank canvas that we had to work with. Um, and that orca was was bit was uh, was already there. I think that was carved in 1985 by Joe Togas. Um and um, you know it, the that placement of that particular carving really really worked out with the mural. So, but you know you get to look at a couple of pictures of the progression of the work here. Um, and um, so yeah, no, you can you can see on the the bottom picture the that's my son that we. That I originally designed in Squawks and Sailor Sun to uh, for my proposal for this particular mural. But you know, this was yeah, this was my first time doing anything this big. Um, you know, working with different mediums. I, we worked with different ver various paints, and um, you know, this was one of my biggest collaborations with um, with really any artist at that point. So. And then there, that's the uh, finished mural. So, um, you know, Ira's design had a, uh, he, had, he had more of a totem pole, I, I think, design for, for his design. And I was like, totem poles don't belong down here, bro. So um, we designed, we, we kind of came up with a welcome figure design. And, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's our welcome figure on the, on the left there. And, um, you know, because of my involvement with uh, with Tribal Journeys, like I said, I'd been um, part of Tribal Journeys since 2003. And um, so really, you know, because of my involvement with, with Squawkson's um, canoe family, I have a lot of pictures of Tribal Journeys. And so we, we looked at tons of pictures from Canoes on the Water. And each one of these canoes depicted in the mural is an actual canoe um, from Tribal Journeys, you know, on the... 
on the far left of the picture, you know, you can see our Squaxin Islands traditional dugout canoe, the Swissalo, and then uh, the, the larger um, white and black canoe is, um, you know, our our late chief Frank, uh, our, our late friend Chief Frank Nelson. Um, you know, that's his canoe, the the Zutni Gwangwis. Um and then there are various other canoes. Um, who I really can't remember, well, you know, what families they come from, but those are actual canoes on the water. Um, and that panel, that panel there, we painted with the Squaxin logo. Um, we threw on a uh, octopus design, and um, you know, if you really, you really can't read it, but it, the the top says uh, Gwizadad, which means teaching of our ancestors, which was the theme for um, 2012 canoe journey. And unfortunately, the mural's gone, but the panel box is still there. <laughs> so it's kind of out of place right now when you if you walk downtown by the water, and um, you know to see the the orca, the carved orca there in 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 context with the mural, it it works in really well. So you know the the placement of that that um, particular carving in that building in that mural really worked out. So yeah, everybody's happy with that until it got torn down. So, but. Yeah, it was a really just and, and really the the three other artists uh, Vince and Kevin and Ira, you know, they all said that there was a really just positive energy surrounding the the painting of this mural that really they hadn't experienced before, and um, you know for me I it, it was I was there too because like I said this was my first um, you know public installation and you know it got to be you know something this awesome and and really it was such a fun fun project to be a part of. Um, and right now we're talking with the current developer um, to not not recreate this mural, but to do another um, mural that ties in with with paddles and canoes and, and, and being on the water. Um, so right now we're in discussion with uh, with that developer to not only do one mural, we're going to do one mural. There's, there's going to be a wall that's gonna, like a two sided wall that's going to be set up with one side facing the water. And then another side facing um, State Street, and so on. On the water side, of course, we're going to paint a mural that depicts, you know, canoes and paddles and water. And then on the on the State Street side of the wall, we're going to paint um, a giant golden raven. So right now we're we're in talks with getting those, trying to hammer out the the details of that contract. So unfortunately, that mural's gone, but they'll hopefully there'll be um, two new murals in its place. So, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that's uh, the canoe, the, the mural project. And then um, three years ago, I was approached by um, Puget Sound Energy to do some uh, vinyl utility box wraps. And you know, these boxes are located in, um, I always wanna say Heritage Park or Sylvester Park, but it's Heritage Park, which was, um, Right on the corner of, um, I want to say Fourth and not Water Street. I can't remember what street that is that crosses it, but it's right on Fourth as you as you cross the Fourth Avenue Bridge, um, and um, you know there's these these utility boxes on the corner of that of of Heritage Park, and um, you know the city had already been wrapping some of their boxes with vinyl. And, and PSC wanted to, to, to kind of cover up these boxes with art. Um, so uh, they approached me and um, luckily for me, I, was, I, I had already learned how to work with Illustrator at the time. So I was able to um, put my designs into graphic work. Um, and um, and uh, this was at the time where I was moving out of my studio in my house and building the studio that I'm in now which is um, about, you know, about 10 feet away from my back door. Um, and so I didn't have a, 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 a space to do any physical work. So I was just on my computer constantly, um, you know, doing graphic work. And, um, you know, Puget Sound Energy, you know, wanted to do these wraps. So um, we were able to, I was able to come up with some designs for them and, um, you know, they wanted to highlight um, renewable energy and habitat restoration. 
So that was uh, that was those those were the parameters that I had to work with, and um, you know, so it kind of came really easy for me what I wanted to do, you know, for solar energy. Of course, you know, we wanted that big giant sun, and this was about the time where they were getting ready to to tear down the Les Schwab building. So um, I didn't really you know recycle the sun, but I, I came up with a a different variation of the sun. I I lost the um, the crescents in the tips of the rays, I added those those longer orange rays that, that surround the, the sun. And I think I changed up the face a little bit, but you know, that's really my standard um, sun design that we put on the box. And then the middle design, the uh, design with um, wind turbines, really that was one of my, that was a really fun design to work with um, because I, I got to, to layer in the the wind that you see on there. Um, if you look closely at the turbines, you know, the wind kind of weaves through the blades. You know, on one blade it goes behind, on the other blade it goes in front of. So I got to work with, um, you, know, tr you know, trying to layer the, uh, the wind effect on those turbines. And really I, I had to do a lot of research as to what those turbines look like because um, really who pays attention to wind turbines? So, you know, I, had to, I wanted to be sure to depict them kind of realistically. And uh, I think I really nailed it for that one. Um, for the bottom one, we went with habitat restoration. And um, if you're not familiar with the layout of um, Heritage Park, it, um, it lies in the area of downtown Olympia that was backfilled with dirt. So historically, that area was all estuary and was, it was the mouth of the Deschutes River. Um, and, and so kind of, um, you know, I've been kind of involved with, um, you know, the habitat restoration, getting rid of that, that dam, the fifth out on the fifth Avenue bridge, um, and to bring back the estuary, getting rid of the, um, the Capitol Lake, um, you know, the people call it a lake, but it's really kind of a cesspool right now. So, um, you know, to, to think about getting rid of, um, you know, the lake and bringing it back. Um, you know, the estuary, you know, so I want, I kind of wanted to highlight, you know, the habitat restoration. And, um, so that's why I created the, the salmon design on the bottom. So, you know, we have schools of salmon, you know, swimming along, um, you know, you can see a healthy eelgrass bed and, you know, with the mountains in the background. Um, and that was, it was kind of a challenge, um, you know, kind of replicating the same salmon, but trying to change up the variation. Um, of the placement, you know, considering there was such a limited space to work with um, for the parameters of the box. But, you know, I really, it turns out I really like that design. Um, and then um, a couple, uh, like a year later, um, you know, the Pioneer Square Association up in Seattle wanted to do their, um, what they call Art Outside the Box series. So they had a series of um, utility boxes around Pioneer Park that were kind of um, sponsored by the community or by the stores in that area. And, and um, initially for the first series, they, had, uh, they, they selected five artists um, to have their designs on the utility boxes. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the artists selected. And um, so we went with the, uh, the salmon design um, on the bottom for the Pioneer Square box. And if you want to take a look at that box, if you want to take a field trip up to Seattle, you can go up to, it's on um, First Avenue, and I think First Avenue and Yesler. It's right across the street from a chocolate chip cookie store. So and you can get yourself a cookie and, and look at some vinyl wraps. Um, since then, they've done a, a, another series of boxes with some really awesome art. Um, you know, so I, I suggest you Google art art outside the box pioneer square if you want to see some of the other designs but you know, there's really fascinating work um, that was done with these boxes here so this is the uh, box that's over at heritage park with the salmon this is the uh, of course the uh, the wind turbine highlighting um, renewable energy 
with the top of the box here on the on the left with that weird angle. I tried to get a better angle on it, but I really couldn't. So that's the best we could do right now. And then the box with the uh, solar energy to motif. Unfortunately, they replaced that box at the park, and they have yet to replace the vinyl wrap on it. So it's just a big green box right now. So yeah, if you ever take a drive down there, you just see a big green box. And then, um, because of there's 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 two large utility boxes here. Let me go back. That um, the salmon box here is um, one of the largest boxes in that little cluster of boxes. And right next to it, there's another box which is equally as big as this box. And that box is um, owned by the city of Olympia. And there was a representative from the city when we uh, kind of dedicated these boxes. And so she she got to see, um, you know, what the final design would look like. And so she's like, yeah, no, we really want to wrap our box up with, with your work as well. And so kind of to tie in with the habitat restoration theme, um, you know, I created this um, Spaqua in the water design. Spaqua is a great blue heron. And, and so kind of, you know, we have... Uh, you know, if you go down to the water, you know, you, you'll still see Spockwa there standing, standing in the shallows, you know, waiting for a little fish to come by. But, um, you know, it was really fun to do this design here because um, I, got, I got to learn how to, to play with the shading. So if you look really closely at the, at the heron, um, it goes from, uh, from the light to the dark um, shades on the, on the head and the neck. Um, if you look at the the body, you can see the shading as well. So it's really kind of a little bit of a progression into my skills working with um, Illustrator. And um, and really, you know, if you notice, <laughs> if you notice that Aaron is standing still, but there's water movement around the legs, and that's because I can't draw feet. I try to do a different different variations on the feet of the spot quite, and they just they just looked awful. So I was like, yeah, let's just put them in the water and cover it up with, with some uh, water water movement. <laughs> so, yeah. Works out like that, though. Still works out for a great design. <laughs> and, you know, here we go with the finished product. Um, you know, this is, um, I think Western Signs up in Seattle did this box for, for the city. But uh, the, I think it worked out great. So, you know. Feet or no feet, it's still a solid design. <laughs> and then this is uh, the art box for um, the one in Pioneer Square, art outside the box. And uh, yeah, no, man, I love drawing salmon. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, and... Um, you know, this is really my my latest installation right now. With the, we used to call it the Giant Salmon Project, but everybody was like, "Come on, man, let's, let's come up with a name for these guys." So, um, you know, because you know, king salmon swim up through um, Bud Inlet and they swim up the Deschutes. So, um, you know, my my idea was to to honor the salmon. That, that provide us um, with sustenance. You know, we every every August, you know, we have our fishermen out there, um, you know, setting out nets. Right now, there's, there's probably, I don't know if the fishery is open, but, you know, the kings are running, and they're running up the Deschutes, so they're running through Bud Inlet. And I kind of wanted, wanted to, um, you know, honor the commitment that the Squaxins made with the salmon people, um, you know, generations ago, that we would always... Um, you know, provide a home for the salmon to, to come back to, um, you know, so, and, and once again, tying in with the, the, the habitat restoration theme, um, yeah, we wanted to, I wanted to honor the salmon. So, um, you know, when we were talking with the developers, you know, Ken and Julie Grogan, you know, one of the initial meetings I had with them, um, they said that they wanted this to, to be the piece that defines Olympia. And, and they wanted they wanted to make a statement and and so um, you know after after sitting down with them and, and and coming up with ideas for for what we wanted to put on the on the wall 
um, you know, I was sitting down. It was I was watching the Super Bowl, and I, I just started sketching out salmon designs. And and um, you know when we look at a design, you know there's three salmon swimming up upriver, and there's one salmon swimming in a circle waiting waiting for her chance to swim up the falls or to swim up the fish ladder. So um, and when I worked it out with that particular um, placement of the salmon, you know, it makes an exclamation point. And so I went to Ken and Julie and I said, well, you, you wanted, you know, to make an ex, you wanted to make a statement, you know, with your, with this piece. And then there you are, I'm giving you an exclamation point. And they loved it. You know, they went, they went bananas over it. So, um, you know, we immediately started, you know, hammering out a contract for that. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to, to get a lawyer who really understood, um, you know, working with contractors and working with developers and, and working with art. So, you know, we had, a, we covered a lot of bases in this, in this contract and it took a really long time to figure this contract out. But, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's my advice if, you know, to any, any artist who's dealing with public insulation, you know, get a good contract, you know, get a contract that spells out everything. So, <clears throat> you know, we did that and, um, you know, we came up with the, the final designs and, um, you know, the materials on this, on the, on the salmon are, um, uh, the, 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 the plate was just under a quarter inch, uh, you know, thick enough to, to be durable, but, you know, not thin enough that they're going to bend. So, um, each salmon is offset four inches from the concrete and they're all backlit with, um, LED rope lights. And, you know, Lindley and I were just talking about this, this particular design and, um, you know, those LEDs that are on the salmon, they're on constantly, except during the day, you know, they're not bright enough to, to, to be seen, but at night, um, you know, these LEDs are, are full spectrum LEDs. So, um, we got a computer system that, you know, can, can run the whole array of colors. Um, and I think the, um, the, the computer um, guy over at the views on fifth development is doing a great job um, learning this whole computer system because it is incredibly complicated you know it's not something you can just plug in and dial in some colors you know there's there's a lot of programming that goes on and um, you know Deontre is doing a great job as far as um, you know managing these lights so you know hopefully we're given Olympia you know just variations of lights each night um, and, um, you know, just the whole process of figuring out these lights was really just for someone who hasn't done anything like this. It was it was it was a really you know big hill to climb. Um, and the whole process of, of designing, um, you know, getting the, the metal cut out, you know, working with a fabricator up in Seattle, finding a, a powder coat um, shop that had an oven big enough for these salmon. Um, and then working with the LEDs, um, we, you know, we had to find a company that produced LEDs that were durable enough for the weather, um, you know, that could withstand salt air and, and wind coming off the water. And then insulation of these, we, you know, we had to find an electrician that, um, you know, kind of really understood the schematics of, of working with these LEDs and, and, you know, running them then through the building and, you know, through through just days and days of phone calls. It was, it was amazing the, the, the amount of people I talked to. Um, but we were able to find a, a, an electric company that really understood the lights. And, um, and I formed a friendship with, with some of the, uh, the electricians on the job. So I was really grateful that, you know, we were able to work together to get this project up and running. So, um, and, uh, so yeah, this is this was a process. Um, you know, everybody. I don't know if you're familiar with with downtown Olympia. You know, if you're from out of town, that building behind me in that upper left corner used to be the um, the headquarters for I think the state corrections department, and it was built like in the '70s or something. And it was this really awful, like mustard yellow and and kind of mustard brown, and um, you know, if you if you Google mistake by the lake, you're going to come up with that old building right there. So, um, you know, the developers just took it down to its bones, really. And um, you know, that stairwell, the concrete is, uh, I want to say, like 20 inches thick. It's it's kind of ridiculous how thick those that, those walls are. But, um, you know, and it was a it was a hell of a time just coring out 
the areas where we needed to run the um, the cords for the lights. But like I said, we found a great electric a great electric company that knew what they were doing. So um, you know, we were able to work work on that that concrete stairwell. But um, you know, to look at the tail pieces there, you know, each tail piece was probably about seventy five pounds. Um, you know, these uh, that steel is not light. Um, and then, you know, you have Sandy standing in the uh, fabricator's workshop next to the, uh, that's the bottom salmon. So just to give you a scale on, on you know, how, how big those salmon are, you know, that bottom salmon is 14 feet in diameter. And each salmon swimming up the building is 19 feet tall by 8 feet wide. Um, so, yeah, it was, and then um, if you look behind Sandy, You'll see that's the head of that salmon that's right there on the floor. Um, so yeah, that's just that's the scale of those salmon. Um, and then, like I said, we had to find a powder coat shop that was big enough. And you know, there are powder coats, you know, a couple powder coat shops here in Olympia, and their ovens were not nearly as big. So we had to go with Seattle Powder Coat, um, which is in South Park in Seattle and um, you know working with those guys was was really awesome you know they were they were really helpful as far as um, you know when we ran into some delays due to COVID um, last year we were able to you know just store the salmon on, on their shelves in the racks and they did a great job um, you know just holding on to them so you know I owe a big big debt of gratitude to uh, you know Seattle Powder Coat and um, you know, David Steele and their crew and his crew. But, um, and then we were able to uh, bring in a uh, vinyl graphics company to do the color. And luckily, the, the graphics company that we went with is next door to Seattle Powder Coat in South Park. So, um, really getting the, the color out of the salmon was, I wouldn't say it was effortless, but it, it, was, it was done fairly quick. So, that was, that was, that was fun. And then, then, you know, the day came where, you know, we're ready for installation. Um, you know, we had these giant templates done up. So we knew where to put um, each salmon and we knew where to put um, each cleat that they would be bolted onto. And that whole process took a little bit longer than we thought, but we got it done. And uh, there was a couple of days between putting up the templates and actually hanging the actual salmon. So there, there was people you know, who thought that was just the art right there was those black silhouettes. And they were kind of like, oh, that looks cool. But I was like, wait, wait, there's more. And <laughs> so we started flying up these salmon pieces. Um, and, uh, you know, the, because of the weather, because of the wind, um, and because of some design flaws, it took us a little bit longer to install these salmon than I anticipated. You know, it was supposed to be a two-day install, but it got dragged out to, to five days of total insulation over one month so you know there was I was kind of up in the air with these salmon <laughs> figuratively um, mm -hmm. you know as far as getting this project done but um, you know we just got a we got a window of a couple of days um, you know we got the install team down and and they really busted their ass to, to make sure everything was done properly so that each salmon um, was secure and so that and each salmon was put up there safely um, So really we put a lot of work into making sure that these salmon aren't gonna fall down and crush somebody or so um, And I, I, I really kind of love walking underneath those salmon and, and just seeing Seeing them offset and seeing the, the LEDs at night so um, and, and so yeah, no, so that picture on the uh, right was kind of the uh, the finished installation for this for this particular, for this particular job, and then you know, just once we got the bugs worked out for the LEDs, um, you know, it took us a while to to figure out, you know, all the channels for all the salmon. You know, for each salmon, there's about eight different wires, and each wire goes into a separate channel, and each channel is routed into a a, a that computer, so you know. Eight times four is 32. So yeah, you got 32 different channels that you're trying to figure out on how to light. And so like I said, you know, DeAntre over at Views on Fifth did a great job figuring out 
how to how to run these lights because now we're we we have this multicolor explosion going on. So you know if you haven't had a chance to go see them at night, I, I suggest you go. They're just really it was really such a fun project to be a part of. And that brings us to our my current project. Um, you know because of the views on fifth project, um, Nisqually Middle School. You know we, we they wanted to do a mural because of the and they were, they were doing their mural they had ideas of what they wanted to do and because of the views on fifth project you know my name came up in the discussion and so they they reached out to me one day and and they they asked well you know do you want to do a mural for our for our school and i go hell yeah i want to do a mural for your school so <laughs> they had already had a couple of meetings with representatives from nisqually as to what they wanted in their mural and um you know because of scheduling conflicts they weren't able to attend any of our planning meetings but my big head idea was to okay you know we got the Nisqually River running off to the north so on one side we're going to put the Nisqually River and then you know because the river kind of comes from Mount Tahoma we're going to put Tahoma right here in the, you know on the big wall behind you and then um, you know we're going to put a forest scene with um, with forest animals um, you know the the location for this for this mural is, is kind of a, you know, there's an entryway to the, to the middle school and it kind of goes up into a big vestibule type type thing, you know, like a big vaulted ceiling. And, um, you know, there's four sides that, um, you know, they want the mural on. And one side is gonna be um, a map, an old historical map that the tribe has. So we're gonna blow, blow up that map, put it on, on wooden panels and hang the panels up. And then they're gonna bring in a, another artist to do some portraits of Nisqually ancestors and elders. So, you know, they're taking care of one wall, which gives me three walls to work with. So yeah, we, we got our forest scene, Mount Tahoma, and the Nisqually River. And in the middle school hallway, you know, for social distancing, they had these little salmon templates. And I go, we're gonna, we're gonna take each one of those salmon, we're gonna cut them out of wood, and we're gonna have each student that wants to paint a salmon, they're gonna have the opportunity to paint their salmon, we're gonna slap it up on the river. And you know they that was they went they they really liked that idea so you know it's really nice I to have to involve the students with um you know some of this project here but um you know so so if you look at the three D model that the um, art director came up with um you know that's the the picture here on the uh, left on the top so like I said we're gonna have a forest scene on one wall Mount Tahoma. And then we're going to have a rising moon and we're going to offset the moon by about maybe an inch, inch and a half. And we bought some LEDs from uh, Home Depot. So we're going to have, we're going to, you know, um, backlight the, the moon and give it kind of like a soft glow. So, and then, like I said, um, the salmon on the Nisqually River part of the mural, you know, is going to be painted by the students. So, you know, you see the moon in the middle, which is going to go rising above Tahoma. Um, the raven, you know, right now I'm touching up the, that raven there. And that's going to go in the upper right corner of the forest. And the art director was able to pull up some images of the um, Medicine Creek Treaty Tree. So we're going to put the raven in the treaty tree. And then we're going to have a uh, mama bear in the forest with her two little cubs and um, you know these pieces I was able to work on over the summer when I was uh, you know driving through Texas Arizona and New Mexico with Sandy so I was able to, to work on these templates here and uh, yeah no so next month when school starts we're gonna you know get hit the ground running on this mural and uh, yeah we'll keep you updated so yeah that is uh, my experience with um, you know public installation so thank you for your time thank you for your attention and that is all I got wonderful thank you Joe uh, you mentioned the Pico gathering at the start of your presentation so I wanted to share with our viewing audience that the Pico was an international indigenous arts gathering hosted by the Kio Mailani Hanapi Foundation in Waimea uh, that's in Hawaii and, and that was in 2007 and Tina and Laura were instrumental in supporting the Pico gathering and uh, Pico was the first international 
Indigenous visual arts gathering I have attended also. And we have some Kanaka Maoli guests joining us for this Zoom presentation who also attended the Pico gathering. So I want to mm -hmm. share a big shout out of Aloha Mai to Haranani, our Kanaka Maoli Ohana. Hey, yeah. Hey, uh, as a multidisciplinary artist, Joe, and in my having an industrial design background and an interest in pursuing public art calls for art, I'm an advocate of indigenizing space and place. So a little historical context in attempts to advocate for the indigenization of space. I served on the board of the United Indians of All Tribes Foundation back when the Seattle Port Authority was constructing the new SeaTac terminal. And so representatives of United in, the United Indians Board met with the C City of Seattle commissioners to advocate for the inclusion of Native American artists' public art inclusion in the SeaTac terminal to reflect the indigenous cultures of the Salish Sea and SeaTac serving as a unique gateway to the Pacific Northwest. Unfortunately, our advocacy fell on deaf ears. So um, it's nice to, uh, to know that the developers on Fifth sought out a local Salish artist in indigenizing the downtown space and urban landscape. So congratulations, Joe. Thank you. Um, I'd love to engage in a conversation with you regarding coming, the coming home installation, um, but we would love to give our viewing audience an opportunity to ask questions. So we're gonna move into our audience question and answer portion of your presentation. And we explained that the viewing Zoom audience can put their questions in chat box and the Facebook live uh, viewing audience can put their questions in the response box on Facebook. Um, and while Laura and Amber are gathering those questions to ask you, I'll start off, off, us off with a question. Um, and, and my question is, I have a background in industrial design, so I'm familiar with scaling up work and it's great to see the scale of the salmon that you shared. Um, can you explain the process you engaged in scaling up the salmon for the placement on the views at Fifth? Thank you. Mm, well, I, I had to take a look at the uh, architectural drawings. And, um, you know, this was my first time working with an architect on a, on a, on a, on a, on a piece. And so I had to figure out how wide the, that concrete structure was, the stairwell. And then because of the windows, I kind of had to figure out that how wide that, fat, fat, that flat piece was. Um, and and Julie Brogan, she wanted the, the salmon to start at 45 feet up, you know, to be seen because there's a three story development on the corner of um, on the corner of um, fourth and I can't remember the other that cross street, but kind of kitty quarter to Bayview. Um, and so, yeah, we had to start off from 45 feet. So that took away um, that effectively gave me about what 85 feet to work with. And so I kind of had to figure out the placement um, of each salmon and, and I kind of had to work out how wide each, the, the bottom salmon would be because I was the widest salmon there. And, um, you know, I, I think I figured out that 14 feet would be optimum and that gave me, I think, three feet on each side of, of, of space to work with on the, uh, on the concrete stairwell. And then we went from work from the bottom up as far as to how much, other, how, what, what kind of space I had left to work with the, the three remaining salmon. So we just, I just divided up by three, figured out the placement and, um, you know, worked with the architect to make sure that the placement of those salmon was um, kind of spot on. And so I think they got, they kind of got tired of my, my questions and, and <laughs> kind of, you know, making sure that I met everything crossed because like I said, this was my first time doing something like this. So, you know, I was kind of a pest to uh, working with, working with Taz. But, um, you know, they were great to work with as well. They were really supportive and yeah, they answered all my dumb questions, so. Oh, they look fantastic, especially when backlit with the LED. I'm gonna pass it over to Laura to see if she has questions. I'm actually gonna pass it to Amber because she has lots of feedback, wonderful feedback on Facebook Live. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have lots of family and friends from New Zealand joining us as well. And they all say, Kia ora, George, and, or Joe, and um, tons of comments and sending love and pride for your work and congratulations. So that's fantastic. We also have uh, Chairman Chris Peters here saying hello and send uh, thanks for sharing your work. Jeremiah George, lots of friends here. Um, 
And then Philip Hilaire actually has a couple of questions for you. So the first is, um, you work in so many different mediums of art, which is your favorite medium to work in and why? Oh man, that's a, that's kind of a hard question for me to answer because I love working with all of them. Um, I've been doing a lot of painting lately. Um, but, um, when I was going to Evergreen, I was able to do some, uh, wood block carving and, um, you know, working, I think what made it so fun was the instructors, um, Lisa Strange and Alex McCarty were, you know, my first instructors at Evergreen and, um, you know, part of that, um, you know, that studio arts program that they had, um, made, made printmaking just really enjoyable. So, um, and I kind of, I kind of miss printmaking. You know, just because there's a lot of uh, a lot of Zen in coming up with the block and coming up with the design and working with the block. So, um, you know, just because I miss it so much, I'm going to say printmaking right now, um, especially wood block carving. And because I don't have access to those big giant presses that they have in the studio, um, you know, I kind of miss working with those presses as well. So, you know, right now um, I'm, I'm going to say I'm missing hard on printmaking. So that's a good question, though, Phil. You know, each, everything I do really is is to you know keep our culture alive you know each medium i work with you know is 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 my main goal is is to to keep coast sailors culture you know present and and make it relevant for not just the ancestors but for the the future generations so you know whatever medium i come up with um you know it's it's, it's always just a, so much fun to work with so but yeah, so that's a great question, Phil. Thanks. And his other question is, who was your inspiration to start making art? I know you talked about that a little bit in the beginning. Well, really, um, there wasn't a, a specific person. Um, like I said, my introduction to the culture was in 2003, you know, being a part of my uh, canoe family and being on the water. And, um, you know, that was my first canoe journey. That was my father's first time being in a canoe. So, um, and then, you know, having, um, you know, George Christ as a skipper or, um, Ray Christ, um, you know, he was, he was always, a, you know, fun to have in the canoe. And, you know, those were, those are my two mentors, you know, in the, in the stern of the canoe. Those are the two people who taught me how to be a skipper. So, and, and, you know, just, they just made canoe journey so much fun for me. And, um, you know, working with Andrea on my first paddle, um, you know, that was, that was a huge, huge thing for me as well. Um, and then afterwards learning how to pull drums, you know, with my cousin Pokey, you know, there's just so many people that, that, you know, kind of inspired me to, to become an artist and to, to do what I want to do what I'm doing today. And, you know, they've always been huge fans of my work. So, um, you know, it's hard to say that there's one person that inspired me. It was re really more just, my, my whole family and my, my whole tribe and my whole community pushing me to, to keep, you know, the Coast Salish culture alive. And then probably the best question to ever be asked is how many fry bread t-shirts do you own and when and where can we buy Joe Seymour design silk scarves and fashion? <laughs> I'm going to say I own three. No, wait. Four fry bread t-shirts. <laughs> a lot comes from the Stephen Paul Judd collection on the uh, NTVS website. Um, as far as fashion, um, I don't know when I'll be able to go back into making clothing or scarves or anything like that. But, um, you know, we did read a really nice article in my MFA contemporary native arts class about... Um, the uh, founder of IEIA, who uh, Lloyd Kiva Nu, who did uh, you know native design fabric prints, so it was it was kind of inspiring to read about his work, and to hear about his history. So maybe after this program, after my MFA, who knows? <laughs> and then another comment from uh, Phil Hilaire. He's on the Crow Shadow Board, and he would like to invite you to come and do a residency at the Crow Shadow Art Institute. I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've been kind of uh, 
you know, um, I've been invited to Crow's Shadow before and it really hasn't fit in my schedule, but I think right now is a good time to go, to go hang out in Pendleton and meet some Umatillas. So yeah, no, let's see if we can make it happen, Phil. And then um, a question from Jeremiah. Any upcoming opportunities to contribute to your community's culture preservation efforts and any online references? Could you read that question again? Do you have any upcoming opportunities to contribute to your community's culture preservation efforts? Um, I know right now we have the uh, water sounds auction coming up. And I um, just spoke with uh, um, Ruth at the museum about donating a piece. Um, so, the, the, and I, I just found out the event will be virtual again this year because of the surge. But um, I'll be donating a, a drum for the, for the museum. Um, and yeah, so, and that auction I, I, I believe is, uh, going to be up and running, I think in two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, no, we'll, we'll be, I'll be able to get a drum for the, for the auction again this year. Great. Karen, Karanani says, Aloha, Joe in Longhouse, Ohana. Congratulations, Joe. Wonderful to see your work and hear your laughter. <laughs> Thank you, Haranani. <laughs> We have time for one more question, if there's any other questions. I have a question. Um, we're familiar at the Longhouse with having to rent a crane because we have to rent a crane for the uh, reinstallation or the, the renewal of the Longhouse Thunderbirds. So Laura's very familiar with the hourly rate at which you have to rent a crane. Um, and that uh, takedown of the Thunderbird took much longer than we had anticipated. I think it took a couple of days, didn't it, Laura? Anyways, my question is, is considering the fact that you've got a contract and you're renting a crane for a two-day install, which turns into a three-day install. How is that handled in the contract? Who pays for those cost overruns? I did. I paid for the for everything regarding the installation. You know, came out of the the contract, um, and um, you know, I was paid a deposit up front, and that went toward the fabrication and the LED lights, and then everything after construction was out of pocket. And so every all the overages, yeah, I had to pay for. So it was, it was kind of a huge learning curve on on this project. And I know, you know, there are better ways to do, you know, installations like this now. And um, you know, so I look forward to my next installation, where um, you know I talked with uh, my mentor Andrea, and she mentioned that you know you got to work it backwards, and then she pointed out some companies that that do installations like this. And I talked to them after the fact, and they said, yeah, you got to work this stuff backwards. You know, pick an installation date, work toward, and then work backwards from that date. So there was, like I said, a giant learning curve. Um, you know, my mistake was going this mostly on my own with my own limited knowledge, um, which, um, you know, is a bad, bad way to go. I don't recommend it. So, um, you know, now that I have the experience and now that, I, you know, I have hindsight, yeah, there are better ways to do it. And, um, yeah, no, so I look forward to the next opportunity to do something giant and metalish. See what happens. Awesome. With, with the uh, phenomenal body of work that you have in indigenizing space uh, in Seattle and Olympia and other places, um, I'd, I'd love to encourage you to apply for the Washington State Arts Commission Public Art roster. Um, it's closed right now. <clears throat> I believe uh, it'll open up in two or three years. They may have a, a, a mid uh, time frame opening. Um, right now, there's 14 people who serve on that public art roster, and Andrea wilber Saigo is one of those, and she's joining us tomorrow. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Um, if there are no more questions, we're basically moving in at 1 o'clock. I see a hand up. One question. JJ asks, Joe, can you repeat when and what the name of the auction is that you mentioned for water sound? The Water Sounds auction is, I believe, it's going to be up and running on the 14th of September virtually. Um, you can check with uh, Squawkson Island Museum and Library and Research Center website 
or check on Facebook and they should have the details for that. Thanks, Joe. Andrea has her hand up. <laughs> okay, Andrea. Hey, Joe. I just wanted to say good job. It's uh, You did good for that first uh, piece there. And next time around, we got this. So. <laughs> Real. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's a trying one when you're doing your first one. So you did good. Just want to let you know that. Have a good one. Enjoy your day. I'll, I'll, I'll you too. You Hi. I'll see you at lecture tomorrow. Sounds great. Have a good one. Thank Come you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. We're looking forward to hosting you tomorrow as our guest. And Sounds again, great. thank you for our viewing audience for joining us here this afternoon. Um, want to thank Joe uh, for sharing his public art with us. It's great to see your body of public artwork, Joe. And we want to thank you for being such a wonderful friend of the Longhouse for going on close to 20 years. Yeah. So uh, join us for tomorrow's Public Art Lunchtime Zoom series with Andrea Wilbur Seigel. We're looking forward to that. And a big shout out of thanks to our, our Longhouse staff team, Laura Vermillion, who is the Longhouse Managing Director, Natalia Devine, who is our Longhouse Program Coordinator, Amber DeVillers, who is our Na Native Programs Specialist, and welcome to our newest uh, staff member at the Longhouse, uh, Cara Briggs, who is our Interim Vice President for Tribal Relations arts and cultures. We have a great Longhouse team working with us and a big thanks and shout out to our Longhouse staff team for their help and their support. Thank you everybody and we hope you can join us for tomorrow. Take care and have a nice day.